Welcome to the Man Whore Podcast. Hey there, freaks and geeks, daddies and doggers. This is Billy Presida, and you're listening to the Man Whore Podcast. Hey, 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 welcome to the show. If you're new, welcome back. If you're not, uh, this is a podcast where on most weeks, I talk to women I've hooked up with about sex, dating, gender, and love. However, this week's guest is not one of my former flames. No, uh, this week I have got London's leading sex expert, Tracy Cox. And yes, that is her real name. <laughs> and I can't wait to tell you more about her in a bit. But first, uh, it, this is going to be exciting. I am going to start live streaming recordings of the Man Whore podcast, uh, both on Facebook Live and Periscope. Sometimes I'm going to be able to announce it in advance uh, here on the show where you can put it in your iCal, uh, and sometimes it's going to be last minute, uh, but the best way to not miss out on this is to like the Man Whore podcast on Facebook and to follow me on Periscope at the Billy Proceda. That's P-R-O-C-I-D-A. Uh, go do that because uh, it's going to be fun. Uh, I did a live stream Periscope with uh, porn star Milka Halili. Uh, over the weekend, and that was a really good time, and I would love uh, to evolve that more. So again, go like the Man Whore Podcast on Facebook. Check me out on Periscope. Uh, always say hello. Look, I oh my gosh, I love hearing from you people. I just, oh, it's it's so much fun. Brightens up my day. I like the tweets. I love the emails. I even love the Reddit DMs, even though they like kind of sort of encroach upon my personal space, but it's totally cool. Uh, I, I I just love hearing from you, you know, like this tweet here from uh, from a new patron at Bookworm013. Uh, Billy Brasita, you are an amazing human being. I am so glad I discovered your podcast. Hashtag fan whore. Oh, I'll, I'm so glad you found it, too, Jackie. Can I call you Jackie. I read the Twitter name. They can go look it up. They'll find out anyway. Um, but I'm so glad you found the show. Welcome to the fan whore army. You know, I also got this one from at tattooed martini. So I'm at work listening to the hashtag man whore podcast as always. And I hear Billy Presida give me a shout out on episode 107 made my day. Well, you know what? At tattooed martini. Why don't you have another day? There's another shout out for you. Oh gosh, just love you people. I love, I love my whores, love my little, I love my people. Um, a great way to help this podcast out is to tell people about it. Let's spread this thing like fucking wildfire, folks. Wildfire. What? Do I, I'm starting to talk like a toddler. Let's fucking spread this thing, people. Right? Come on, and it's starting to happen. I have a couple short anecdotes that uh, that exemplify that uh, exemplify this. I uh, a couple weeks ago, I had sex with a lovely woman from the Tinder. Very good time. I'm sure you'll hear about it at some point. And about a week, like then last week, she texts me. She says, "Hey, I'm on a Tinder date right now, and this guy we're talking about comedy." And he said, "Hey, shot in the dark." Have you heard of Billy Persida? And she's like, oh, ho, ho. <laughs> who do I know Billy Persida? <laughs> I squirted all over his face last week. Oh, I know Billy Persida. <laughs> she didn't say any of that. She kept it in her head. But I was like, she told me this. I was like, yeah, I got like a pod boner right now. Yes. So I came home uh, to the house and I wanted to tell my roommates this because I was very excited. I wanted to I wanted to brag to somebody. And that's when the new roommate, Robbie, goes, wow, Billy. I mean, I was kind of waiting to tell you, but uh, I was on a Tinder date last week and I was telling my date about my roommates and mentioned you're a comedian and you have a, a podcast that it's a sex podcast. And she goes, oh, really? What's his name? He says, Billy Persida. She goes, oh, wow, I listened to that podcast. I'm like, yeah, that's what's up. Fuck yeah, people. So thank you to everyone who's te who's telling their friends, who tweets about it, and who shares uh, the link to the podcast on Facebook and all those places and such. Word of mouth is really how podcasts spread is what I'm starting to discover. 
I mean, that's how I've discovered most of my favorite podcasts. I listen to WTF because comics were talking about it. I listen to You Made It Weird because uh, Pete's then ex-girlfriend or girlfriend Jamie Lee was telling me about it. I listen to Dan Savage because of uh, a woman from episode, the guest from episode nine, Emily, she told me about Dan Savage on our date. And that's how I got into that. So, you know, this, this is how it works, people. So keep doing that. Uh, last week, you heard from a couple of uh, porn performers, Chanel Preston and Susie Q, about the dangers of Proposition 60 in California. And we've got uh, another week until Tuesday's election uh, on the 8th. And I, I just want to stress one more time that uh, if you vote uh, in the state of California, please vote no on Prop 60. And here to tell you why are another couple of porn stars. Uh, first up is Andre Shakti. Uh, in addition uh, to a porn performer, uh, Andre also calls herself a writer, a wrestler, and a slut. Here to tell you why harassment is not a California value. Hey everybody, my name is Andre Shakti and I am here to tell you to vote no on Proposition 60. A little about me, I have been in the sex industry for 10 years, I have been in the porn industry specifically for 4 years, and I current re- currently reside in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, if this bill passes, it will directly and devastatingly affect my life, my livelihood, my stability, and the intimate encounters that I have with other people, both on set and in the bedroom. Um, first of all, I'm just personally affronted by this bill. It is a direct attack on sex workers and porn performers in particular, um, It's condescending. It's treating us like children. Us in the sex industry call this complex uh, Captain Save-A-Ho. It's when someone completely unrelated to the sex industry, usually an anti-trafficking, right-winged, anti-sex work uh, individual, um, comes swooping in on a white horse vowing to save the poor sex workers from themselves, um, overtly insinuating to the general public that we can't be trusted to make the most intimate decisions, our own decisions, about our health, safety, and wellness when it comes to our work. This is offensive because, number one, we're not children. The anti-trafficking movement um, should be focusing its efforts on children, not consenting adults in a legal labor industry. Um, So that's number one. Number two is that we are literally sexual professionals. You know, random civilians don't go swooping in telling a professional quarterback how to throw a ball or confronting a doctor in his doctor's office about a diagnosis that he's giving them. Um, In that same way, sexual professionals should be held, if anything, to a higher standard than civilians in terms of our knowledge and education around risk assessment and harm reduction strategies when it comes to STDs. Um, We literally do this for our job on a daily basis. Um, We are having educated, um, complex conversations about protecting ourselves and our loved ones about... um, being able to vet out risk and what risk we are and aren't able to take on for ourselves. And this is completely separate from the fact that the industry already regulates itself with maximum efficiency and effectiveness. There hasn't been a documented transmission of HIV on a porn set since 2004 because most of us, in order to work, get tested every 14 days with our results uploaded to a national database. And if we test positive on a test, that means that we can't work. That means that all of a sudden now our livelihood, our stability, um, our income is severely compromised. So not only are we already smart and educated about sex because it's our job, not only does our industry already do an amazing job at regulating it from the inside, but we're also motivated to keep ourselves safe because if we don't, we can't put food on the table. So that's number one. Number two, the bill underestimates porn consumers and oversimplifies the process of protecting oneself during sex. Just because protection isn't visible 100% of the time during a sexual interaction doesn't mean that it isn't being utilized. Condoms are only one option in terms of protecting yourself against sex, against the transmission of STDs during sex. And as of 2013, the CDC released a study 
uh, Don Smith actually spoke to this for the CDC, um, commenting on condom efficiency and effectiveness and spoke to the fact that research showed only 70% effectiveness in preventing HIV. Um, Condoms are not automatically the best option for everybody. They're not also really uncomfortable as they were designed to only be worn for like 20 to 30 minutes of penetration at a time. So when you're using condoms over and over again for five, six hours on a porn set throughout an entire day, not only are they drying out, they're bunching up, they're tearing, they're incredibly uncomfortable, but they also can actually abrade the skin and create something called condom rash or condom burn, which makes you more susceptible to receiving the transmission of an STD. Um, and finally, not unlike the reproductive health movement, um, this bill is a lot like removing the choice from what we can and can't do with our bodies. Um, It's setting a really dangerous precedent for other labor industries as well. The monetary incentivizing of California residents to sue, to file lawsuits willy-nilly at people involved in a particular industry if they perceive them to not being as safe as they would like them to be um, is incredibly dangerous. It's akin to walking past a construction site, seeing a man not wearing a helmet, and then being able to call in and file a lawsuit against him. So please, please, please vote no on Proposition 60. Um, Again, I am Andre Shakti. I can be found at at Andre Shakti on Twitter, Andre Shakti on Facebook, or Andre Shakti xxx.com and I welcome you to contact me personally with any additional questions you may have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andre, for that. And uh, and next up to tell you why you should vote no on Prop 60 is virtual reality porn queen, Ella Darling. Hi, my name is Ella Darling and I am asking you to vote no on Prop 60 in California. Prop 60 is bad in so many ways, but I want to tell you how it's going to affect me personally. I've been a porn performer for seven years, and um, basically what this is going to do is chase me either out of porn or out of California. It will create legislation that makes it dangerous for me and other workers like me to do the jobs that we do. Um, It will incentivize California residents to sue me and harass me and my contemporaries. Um, if we make any money outside of simply the check that we're paid on set, um, it's dangerous, it's harmful, and it's bad for residents, laborers, and California residents. Basically, if we either don't use a condom, or even if we do use a condom, and it's simply not apparent in the films that we create, it will make it so that any California resident can sue me and workers like me. And um, in the process, reveal our legal names and home addresses. And we've already had problems with people trying to aggregate our legal names and our stage names and cross-reference those. So it would make people who already have a vendetta against us, either people who love us or hate us to absurd degrees, it would give them access to our private information. Now, a lot of performers choose not to perform with condoms. In fact, most performers make that choice. Um, what performers want is the choice. We want to be able to choose to perform with condoms if we want to. But most performers, even when given that choice, choose not to perform with condoms. And here's why. Um, realistically, the work that we do is not the same as normal, private, typical sex. The sex that porn stars and porn performers engage in professionally can sometimes last hours. It can sometimes be with people that you're not even sexually attracted to. It's just, I mean, it's a job. It's not something like um, the private sex that people elect to have. And it can last for hours sometime. From time to time, it can last, you know, much of the day. And we don't, your body doesn't make the same natural lubrication when you're having sex with someone professionally as it does when you're having sex with someone for the sake of having sex. So in the process, when you have something like latex or similar materials introduced into that process, um, there's an added level of friction, and that friction can create abrasions on our genitals. Um, And when you have an abrasion on your genitals, which is created from introducing something like a condom for some people, that increases the 
probability of contracting a bacterial infection or a viral infection if there is uh, any bacteria or virus present. So even if there isn't an STI present, it makes it more likely that, for example, uh, I'm going to contract bacterial vaginosis or yeast infection because there's a separation inside of my body as a result of the material of the condom used. So even if it's it seems like a no-brainer, like, of course, well, why wouldn't you guys want to use condoms? Well, here's why. Because in the unique experiences that we have in our jobs, we are actually more susceptible to things like condom rash or internal abrasions, and that makes the work that we do a little bit more high risk, and it makes anything that we do more high risk, because when you introduce an abrasion like that, it can be more harmful to your body. Um, but beyond the condom rash, beyond the abrasions, the real harm is that it incentivizes any California resident to sue the entire production, including performers, if we have any financial stake in the production. And that's just dangerous, it's harmful, and it's terrifying. So please, please, please vote no on Prop 60. It's bad for us, and it's frankly just bad for California. So thank you. For more information, uh, visit StopProp60.com. And uh, and, uh, and while, while we're on a political kick, I uh, wow, emails got some emails over the last uh, like ten days. If you remember, I had asked for anyone who listens to my show who is voting for Trump to email me because it was like mm, that seems odd. Why would that exist? But I'm curious. And uh, I only got one person who said they are voting for Trump. However, I did get multiple emails of people who said they're not voting for Donald Trump, but they're also not voting for Hillary. And look, now, I've, I've already said this on the show. I don't like Hillary. I'm not a fan of her. I don't really trust her. I don't think she's very consistent. However, she does know how the office of president works, which s- sounds like a very low bar to clear, but this is 2016. We are in an era of low bars to clear. Now, look, I'm not here to tell you to vote for Hillary. I mean, I will tell you don't vote for Donald Trump, but I won't tell you to vote for Hillary Clinton. Uh, I am voting for Hillary Clinton begrudgingly. I am begrudgingly voting for her. I am not happy about it. I miss Bernie, but uh, I will vote for her. And and here's something to think about. Look, if you live in a in a staunt, an overwhelmingly red or blue state, and you want to vote for Joe Stein or Gary Johnson as a protest vote, I get it. Okay, that's fine. Do your thing. I call it a protest vote. Uh, even if you think it's like a genuine vote, I say that in the sense that like neither of them are going to win the election. Um, but it will be a way of saying to politicians in this country that this particular area you know, has these sets of values. It's like, hey, well, you know what? 8% of us think both of them are bullshit and maybe you should pay attention to this over here. I get that. However, if you live in a swing state, if you live in a purple county of a swing state, I would encourage you to not be selfish with your vote. Especially if you are, I don't know, white. If you're like me and you're like a straight white guy. Don't be selfish with your vote because it's not, it's not about you. This particular year, it's just, it's not about you. It's bigger than you. Uh, Because again, before I said, you know, uh, Hillary knows how the office of president works and that's not really a knock on Trump. It's just to say that like Trump is going to just hand the white house to Pence. We already know as much because earlier this year he was going to, you know, it was leaked that he had offered the vice president um, spot to John Kasich, who turned it down. But he said, like, you know, I would I'd make you the most powerful vice president in history. Why? Because he doesn't really know what he's doing, but but he let the vice president do it. And and Pence, I'm not scared of Trump when it comes to civil liberties. Like, I don't think he hates queers. I just I, I don't think Trump really hates a group of people. I think he just hates poor people uh i I don't think he cares if you're black yellow white gay trans whatever i just i think he just cares what's in your bank account uh at the end of the day but pence is the one who scares me because pence doesn't hide his shit pence is not good for women pence as the governor of indiana 
explicitly said he would su- he supports gay conversion therapy. Pence has signed into legislation terrible LGBT laws and laws uh, that are against women getting access to health care. It's he is the one who scares me. And if he's going to have free reign of the White House, you have to think about that. A Pence vice presidency is only setting up for a Pence presidency for 2020 or 2024. So when you're in Ohio or Iowa or the way things are looking, like Arizona even, and you're like considering being like, fuck it, I'm voting for Johnson, fuck both these assholes. I'm like, look, I'm you're not wrong. But if we can just talk, be adults about this for a moment, it's not all about you. If your biggest priority, for example, like Matt, who we spoke about last week, good guy, hey, Matt, uh, if your your biggest political priority is your guns, okay, and for some cockamamie reason, you believe that um, it you have to vote between guns and the civil liberties of others, like gay people. You're not in that situation, but if you think you are, let's pretend that that's the case. The civil liberties of others, of gays, of women, of black people, are infinitely more important right now than your right to have a semi-automatic rifle. You don't have to choose between, but a lot of you seem to think you do. So let's live in that fairy tale land. It's not all about you. So that's something to, to think about. And hopefully next week, you know, we've, we all grown a huge sigh of relief that Hillary Clinton won and we all just start, I don't know, hoping Cory Booker runs in, in 2020. And by the way, if, uh, you know, some people said I knocked middle America, if you think I'm unfair to your region of the country, email me man, at gmail.com. Shoot me any, like, tell me, like, call me out on my bullshit. I might be wrong. I'm open to listening. I also might be right if I, if I rag on your state for like having shitty sex education, it's because it has shitty sex education, which by the way, could apply to almost every state in the union. Anyways, let's get off the politics. Okay. I've got something. To so for the next few weeks, uh, I'm going to be recommending to you a couple podcasts that are sex related, that are really good. that I think you all would like, uh, Doing a, doing a little cross promotion with some shows that I think uh, overlap with our values here at the Man Whore Podcast. So uh, first coming up this week is a promo from the Swinging MILF Podcast, which is all about, well, you guessed it, swinging. If you enjoy steamy podcasts, You'll want to tune in to the Swinging Milf Podcast with me, Sally Swings, where I keep it real and I dish out the juicy details of my sexy adventures, hard lessons learned, and have guests join me to discuss hot topics all about the swinger lifestyle. Add it today to your sexy podcast playlist. Go to theswingingmilf.com slash podcast or search for the Swinging Milf Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher or Blueberry. As a word of caution, this show isn't shy when it comes to sex. I get down to business, so there is a clothing optional dress code. So check out the Swinging Milf podcast anywhere you listen to the Man Whore podcast. And finally, now is time for our guest this week, Tracy Cox. Tracy Cox is London's leading sex expert. Uh, arguably the first person to be called a, quote, sexpert in that cutesy fashion, right? Okay. Um, I, I met up with her when I was in London, and uh, thank you again to everyone on Patreon who sent me to London, and Olivia, you too. Had a, had a really nice time talking to her. Beautiful apartment. Uh, <laughs> there's something about, like, just really successful sex people that they have these, like, gorgeous fucking homes. And we had, like, a Great conversation. We covered a lot of fucking topics. I mean, we talked about comprehensive sex education. We talked about porn, uh, gay rights, Dan Savage, erectile dysfunction, sex toys. I mean, just all, all the get. We ran the gamut on sex topics. I had a really good time with her. The, the The episode actually runs a little long because I I just didn't want to stop talking to her. I could have kept going all night. So uh, I really think you're going to enjoy it. Uh, she is written for Cosmo. 
She has uh, written a, a ton of a ton of books. She also sells uh, her own line of sex toys. Me and Tracy Cox. Stop giggling at the name. Be adults. But it, it, it's connected. Okay. Uh, if you hear me, if you see me like do one of these, um, then it just means get closer to your okay. face. Yep. But you're a professional. You've been doing this since uh, I was like born. So <laughs> Probably. Yeah. 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 How how long have you now been? Um, a sex expert i've been a sex expert for well i don't know it's sort of a weirdy journey because my big sister was used to work for family planning in australia so mm. she was she knew all about sex and all my friends all my kids at school got it. all the kids at school knew that my sister worked at family planning so they would come to me because so she's four years older than me and they'd come to me and they'd say you know can you ask your sister was this, does this mean i've got an sti or does this mean i'm pregnant or whatever so i'd go trotting home to my sister and then she'd tell me so by the end of it i could just go yeah you've got an sti i just knew the <laughs> answers and then i went and then my mum and dad split up when i was 15 and it seemed like a very obvious love sex choice to me and then I went to university and I always wanted to be a journalist. Well, what do you mean by that was an I obvious know, love it was like, I, I knew he loved it. Was, it was sort of what made me want to um, study psychology, really, because I could see that he still loved my mum, but there was obviously something going on. And I just thought, God, is sex that powerful that it could do that? I don't think it was necessarily that, that looking back. But I think when I went to university and I did journalism, then I thought, well, hey, I really want to do sex therapy as well and psychology. So I ended up doing that and then ended up after that um, – becoming a journalist that specialized in sex, really. I edited Cosmo you, for a while. Yeah, Cosmo. Yeah, Cosmo was hilarious. During, uh, it, it was so good. It was, <laughs> it was when everybody, this is in Australia, and this is, and everybody bought magazines. I used to get freebies. I used to honestly go home to my sister and mum with suitcases full of freebies. But I don't know how everything. Australia's Cosmo was, but same. in the, st- yeah. Same, same, same. Those, yeah, the and laughable I met Helen sex Gurley tips. Brown. She was oh, it's, it's just sex oh. tips all over the place. So I was writing all that sort of stuff. Then after that, I came. Well, I, I yeah. So I did all that, and then I wanted to write a book because I thought I was researching all and doing all the writing about sex all the time, and I couldn't think of one book that I thought was really good. That was back in the days when you had white coat, very professional, like, you know, um, gynecology type written books or really trashy shit. We talking like 90s? Yeah, well, it was 1999 when I wrote my first book. So I couldn't find one that was really practical. And I wrote a series of articles for Cosmo that was like how to masturbate, put your fingers here, move it around a bit, add some like really practical stuff. And no one had done that before. And it literally, it sold out everywhere. All the Cosmos around the world bought that story and they were like wow that's the best sale so I thought brilliant I'm gonna write a book on I'm, and I wanted to call it sex how to do it and have a practical thing but they, they it's were a pretty like, obvious title yeah, it's yeah, like it is. I thought it was a brilliant title but they made it hot sex how to do it in the end mm. so I had all these ideas and anyway then I went to this um party with another because I used to be the editor of the magazine and this other woman was an editor of the magazine who was now a publisher no no it wasn't her first I met this woman at a party who was clear off her face on Coke. I had no idea about Coke back then. <laughs> and she said, oh, my God, I went to Could you tell she was on Coke at the time? No, I didn't have a clue. Because I also don't do drugs. So people yeah. come up to me, hi, and then uh, I'll, I'll think we just had a great conversation. Yeah. And then you leave and someone else is like, yeah, they're just rolling balls on Molly. I'm like, yeah. I had no idea. <laughs> I, know. I feel like I was lied to. I know. Well, Coke, <laughs> you can, I still can't tell. Because they're just really enthusiastic. Yeah. So this girl was like, listen, I work for a publisher and you're amazing. I'm you know, going to get you published. Yeah, I'm going to get you I'm published. I'm going to get you a book. Yes. <laughs> so she said, but get it to me by tomorrow. It's got to be tomorrow morning. It's got to be tomorrow morning. <laughs> so literally, I went home and wrote this book proposal with matchsticks in my eyes because I was a bit pissed. You should have done some coke. Help, it probably would have been yeah, easier. Yeah, it would have helped me a lot. <laughs> Got it to her. I, I didn't hear a word. Anyway, about a month later, still hadn't heard a word from this bloody woman. As it turns, and then I ran into another editor who said, oh, look, I'm in publishing, send it through to me. And I thought, well, shit, I've already sent it through to this other publisher. But, and then I just thought, well, obviously, and I, she said, if you send it to anyone else, I just lied outright and said no. And then I think, <sighs> then we ended up getting the book published and it did, I think it sold millions worldwide. And about, eight, or was it 10 years later, five years later, maybe, I got a rejection letter so Christ knows where that went. Uh, but she was just like a secretary or something off her face. But anyway, it made me get on and do it. And then, 
So Hot Sex came out and it was such a success because it was the first of its kind that actually talked about sex in a normal way. It was quite funny. I, I can write decently. And how, how old were, are you when you published this? So, well, I'm 54 now. So that's how long how, I was there. I don't know. How old was if, I? Uh, I don't know. If, I don't know. And, um, so, 16 years ago, that's like uh, thir- 30s? No. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, in your 30s. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, so 30. So I wrote that. And then, so nothing much happened with that to begin with. And I remember saying to them, well, what's a good sale? And they said, look, if you sell 2,000 copies, that's really good. And in the end, it's like millions. And then it got bought by England and America. And suddenly I was on this author tour. And then everyone kept this, the whole sexpert thing. I was the one that initially got called that. I remember like in interviews, they say, so I guess you're like a, you're like a sexpert. And I was like, okay, I'm a sexpert. What a weird thing. Sounds like I just lie around with Calvin Klein (laughs) Klein models and practice. But, um, and then from there I got TV shows and wrote other books and, you know, and then now do a sex product range. So it's been a hell of a journey. I've been very lucky, actually. I worked my ass off, but I've been very, very lucky. It's amazing. Uh, you were showing me before we started you, that, you know, you've got this wall of books. And then in the back of, of, the, of the flat, you have a different bookshelf just for your books. And I was like, that's <laughs> insane. That's an, it's an yeah. incredible. So fi- 15 books in lots of different languages. But my friends used to just absolutely, I'm engaged now, but guys used to come back to the flat and they'd, they'd just be nervous anyway because, I mean, dating as a sex expert is difficult. I was going to ask you. That. They'd see that and honestly, penises just run away from me. They're terrified of me. They will go back inside rather than <laughs> come out and play. So, um, yeah, it, is, it was sort of. Yeah, it can be quite daunting. Plus, I did body language. I did a whole show on body language and sort of really studied up on that. So it was sort of double whammy of shit. She's just, she's got. A There's psychology no, I can't. Degree. I can't trick her. I can't get There's away. There's no tricking anything. here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so I guess I'm going to have to actually like be myself. <laughs> yeah, but it was um, so. It was always quite funny. They used to call it the 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 wall of deflation because it would always make men not get erections. But ah. it sounds like I had a load of men in here. I didn't, but. It was fun, though. Were you, so you were dating regularly while you were writing the sex columns for yeah. Cosmo and the books and yeah. everything? I was ma- – well, Cosmo – I was – I've been married before, mm. about to get married again. Um, but that was when I was – that's before I wrote the first book. Mm. So that was when I was at Cosmo. I was with somebody for seven years, my husband – and then um, we broke up and then dating, dating, dating. I did have a few long-term relationships. Okay. And then now I've been with Miles for four, four years and getting married next year. Wonderful. Yeah, I never Very thought I'd fun. bother getting married again, but it's sort of quite nice, actually. It's, you know, so I've had on a couple other like uh, British guests before. And, yeah. you know, I've, I, America, we have our own sex education problem. That's huge. But apparently, and I was asking, so like, what's your sex education? It's like, oh, we don't do that. Like, we don't, we don't talk about this. It's pathetic. It's absolutely pathetic. And I tried about when I was doing lots of TV. So probably I did a show called Would Like to Meet, which was all about dating. And I was quite, you know, everybody liked me. And they were like, oh, that'd be great if you could come in and talk to schools. And we had a few projects going with the BBC where I would go in and do it. You've heard of Jamie Oliver, right? A little bit. Probably. Yeah. I've, I've probably read the name somewhere. <laughs> well, he went into schools and took on the school lunches. And I wanted to go into schools and, ah. and talk about sex education and teach sex education. Because at the moment, it's taught by the teachers. Can you imagine how you know embarrassing it is for the teacher to suddenly have to talk about sex? Is it, is it required in the you UK? You can opt in and opt out. The, parent, it, the parents cannot the parents can opt in or but opt otherwise, out. But otherwise, like every school has to teach it. Yeah, but it's like one lesson. It's just pathetic. It's not good. There's no life skills. There's no relationship skills. So I kept, we get, we kept getting really close to getting the show green light and then everybody would freak and they'd freak because I didn't have any kids of my own and they'd freak because they still in England and in other countries, apart from Scandinavia, have this thing that knowledge is going to make these kids like if you talk to kids about sex they're going to run away and they're going to want to do it which is just rubbish it's quite the opposite they're already doing it i know if i mean they it's it all it does in actual fact most kids i've i've had done lots of work with teenagers and teenagers who really want to have sex are curious and when you explain to them what's actually going to happen when they have sex they're like oh my god i didn't quite realize that and they actually put it off the more information you give teenagers, the less they, they go the into scarier, it. The scarier, they real, it is. The scarier it is. because sex is fucking terrifying. But it is terrifying. But it's Isn't so good, it so I, I don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it is terrifying. I mean, I remember when I lost my virginity, I had this big sister, so I knew all about clitorises. I knew all of who, you know, kept me very well informed about mm. sex. 
And but when I had sex, I had no idea. I'd sort of miss the fact that people moved. So it was just like, what the hell is this? I just sort of thought you just put it in there and that was it. And you were done. And you just lay there. And that well, for, was it. for some sad people, that it is. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. There are some people that's it was all so it is. barbaric. I remember thinking, what the hell is this? And freaked out. I just thought this is just animalistic. I didn't do it again for another year. I just did not have sex. I remember going home to my mum, just saying, what the hell is that? This is just awful. And she said, oh, get in a bath, darling. We'll put a neck to knee nice and you can just forget about it. For oh, go mom. I know. She's brilliant, my mum. Oh, that's, that's Absolutely awesome. amazing. Yeah. There's so many uh, moms out there who would have a way uh, negative reaction. <laughs> yeah. No. But I think mum and dad had split up. So we were, we were going through that, you know, we have to be friends business. And I've, told, I've always told my mum everything and still do. She's 80. She's on Instagram. She's still kayaks. She's 80 on Instagram. Yeah. I don't even have Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> she's great for my mom. That's no, awesome. so non judgmental. Oh, man. Yeah, she's pretty good. So the sex ed here is also abysmal, but it seems like British people are like slightly like, why are British so prude? Then we escape. I think Americans are pretty. I, th- I think Americans are fucking crazy. We sell, we'll sell a stick of gum with sex. Yeah, yeah. I mean, of I, I will buy that stick of gum, but I still think it's like that. Strange that yeah. sex is like everywhere in our culture, and here though. Yeah, and here. But I don't, you know. Um, I but, don't know whether the British are that prudish. We've got okay. a reputation of being prudish. I think Americans are quite prudish. Huh? What makes you think that? I think, uh, well, first of all, I have to preface this by saying everywhere I go, when I used to do all the book tours, they'd always try and make me say which nationality is best. And the only clear, I mean, obviously, I'm talking about the Western world only here, but I'm sure ISIS have their own sex rules. Um, but I, the only time I've ever seen a difference is in Scandinavia, where I think they really do have a very cool attitude to sex. And I think they've got it right. But America, I've always found quite conservative when i think it's conservative when it comes to kids but as soon as you're you know 18 22 they kind of be like well there's no save in this one they, i don't know about, yeah i don't know i mean also my I, I have to admit my opinion is based off of like four british people i know <laughs> yeah, yeah but all of them uh you know one throws sex parties uh in america jesus Who's who? Is she uh, killing kidding genevieve lejeune she runs a uh, skirt club it's women only yeah. play party um and she talks about how like you know she had to Form it because she was having trouble finding things in the UK. I was like, okay, uh, Haley Quinn, who like also like I was asking her about her experience in sex and sex ed in this country. She's like, yeah, we don't like talk about it out loud. It's yeah. like a thing we all do, but we don't talk about it. It's very proper. Yeah, I suppose so. I suppose I don't. But know. I might be and wrong. I have a very skewed um, judgment, I guess, because everybody talks to me about sex because they know that they can, sort mm-hmm. of thing. So I guess, but I, I don't know. I think in the um, I don't know. I think it's about the same as America. I think British people perhaps don't talk about it so much, but I think behind closed doors, they get up to all sorts. I think British people are probably kinkier. Yeah. I reckon they probably do get up, up to more than, I don't know though. I mean, how do you know what people get up to really? You can, I mean, they can tell you, but how do we really know? I think it's the quiet ones that don't talk about it much. That oh, those are the, those are the freaks. Yeah. yeah. But in America, I don't know. When I think about America, I think, remember that whole thing when buddy Janet Jackson flashed a boob, but you know, there was the wardrobe malfunction. Right. But again, that's because kids are care less here. Well, that's because like kids are watching. I mean, again, I see, Americans get very weird about kids and sex. Mm. Uh, I see again, as soon as they're 18, it kind of goes like out the door, but uh, they get very weird about it. whereas in, like you said, in the scan, like Scandinavia and yeah. areas like, they encourage the teenagers to have sex and safe sex. And they'll be like, yes, you can bang upstairs. Just be safe about it and, yeah. and whatnot. They really have. I've just had my, actually, my brother's just in, been in Scandinavia and I've just come back from Copenhagen and they just have the right approach to everything. Like in one of the park, nothing to do with sex, but in one of the, um, they've got this beautiful cemetery, which is a park and a cemetery and one part of it's active. And in any other culture in the world, it would be, you know, like, so people are actually being buried there now still. It would be no sunbathing, no this, no that, do, do not make noise. But they just had a really sweet little thing that said, look, this is the one active bit. You know, so it's probably not the right thing to do to come and sort of be all loud and look really cheery because these people are just going through a grieving process. So if you don't mind, it'd be much better if you just did it, you know, some baked and had a picnic in another part of the park. And yeah. that's their whole thing, isn't it? Everyone's just like, hey, don't be a dick. Yeah, all right? exactly. They're very cool. Very cool, the Danes. There was that. Uh, there was this documentary that came out earlier this year called... Um where to invade next is Mike, oh, yeah. is Michael I haven't Moore. I've seen it, but I've heard a lot about it. And I'm not even a huge Michael Moore fan. And, uh, but I really liked it. I really, and the idea, I mean, it's a cheesy, 
you know, uh, the concept uh, or the, the structure of the thing. And he's yeah. saying, like, I'm invading your country to steal a concept from your country. So oh, okay. he'll go to a, a France where, like, uh, you know, the food in the in all the schools are is really nice, high end food and it's healthy food. And it's like, we're going to steal this idea. And Italy, the paid vacations, we're going to steal this idea and bring it back to America. Yeah. And he goes to the Scandinavian countries and all of them were just so like goddamn chill. Yeah. No homework. I, yeah. can, I can get behind no homework. <laughs> See, no, I didn't realize there was no homework. <laughs> One of I, them. I forget. It was Norway or yeah. Sweden. No homework in the country. And in Iceland, I don't know whether about still now, but I'm pretty sure they have no welfare. And it's they've got almost 100% employment because because they've got no Aren't welfare. there only like 17 of them? Yeah, there are a <laughs> tiny amount. But like my friend from, from when I, because I used to go there and do the book tours. I used to love it over there. Because it's such a small country that people come up to the airport and go, oh, I saw you on telly this morning. You were great. Mm-hmm. But she said, because you know that there's no welfare, if you need like your kitchen done or something, there's a little old man down the street who you know can paint, you get him in. You don't do call it. a company, you call yeah, Jim. Yeah, you call, yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's exactly right. So maybe it works there because it's community. But I think we could all learn a few. I mean, they got, did you read about the old people's home where they've got this, um, this old people's home? And I think it's in, um, Amsterdam. Okay. Um, and they got students can come and live in this old people's home, which is quite a cool old people's home, free, because they want the old people to have fun. So what they've got these students living there for free, and all they have to do in return is spend a few hours with the old people. And apparently it's like just these old people have suddenly got complete, you know, new lease of life because they've got young people there. And there's no rules. There's no like, but you're not allowed to do this or that. They can They're do learning whatever Instagram. they want. Huh? Like they're learning Instagram yeah. like your mom. But they can do whatever they want. They can, you know, like come in late. They can bring in people to have sex with as, as in, you know, partners and stuff like that. They can drink. They can take drugs if they want. There's no rules. Right. And it's it's so perked everything up. That's the right attitude, isn't it? Think of that. Who comes up with that idea? Like that know. idea does not come up. No one thinks of that in America. No. Well, it wouldn't think of it. And in it Amsterdam, they'd anywhere. smoke a joint and be like, you know what would be a good idea? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let's put some students in but you'd never be able to do it in england or australia or america because there'd be so much health and safety and you know you might trip up an old person and they might whereas there people just go look let's just see what happens mm-hmm. and i think they like that with sex i think they have a fantastic idea about sex but i do remember going to sweden and um and to stockholm and we were doing a show called the sex inspectors and all the journalists were quite you know when i kept saying you've really got the right attitude they said we're sick of this image of promiscuity that we you know we <laughs> we're sort of free love and all this stuff. And they said we're not everybody's quite the opposite way so they they were re- they were reacting against mm. that sort of you know all they're so free with sex and stuff like that because they're saying well we're not anymore we used to be but i don't think we we are anymore but i don't know maybe they've got over that by now i hope so I, I, yeah i hope so too i hope it's us well yeah everyone there's fucking yeah. gorgeous we, yeah. you'd want to have sex all the time too if everybody looked like a goddamn model <laughs> yeah uh but i no, i would like for i don't know the states to adopt some of the more liberal ideas yeah. towards uh sex and sexuality i think but. we're so politically correct we are so we try and protect it's very obviously you have to protect kids and stuff mm. like that but it's it's uh, this this knowledge is power yeah. the more information good non non-judgmental practical information you have out there the better we're all going to be now the joy of this age now is that there is so much online that mm-hmm. is bloody good I mean, not but there's with, equally as much that's bloody crap. bad. Yes, yes, you know, yes, you're there gonna is. For, for every for every Scarlet Teen site, there is some Christian site that's saying like, oh, you know, condoms don't work, right? Yeah, like, yeah. So you've got to be very, you know, careful with what you look at. But I mean, if you're reasonably bright, then you know you can at least it's there. I mean, in the old days, it just wasn't there, was it? There yeah. was no information. But at least with with your schools, at least it's mandatory that you can then improve upon what the curriculum is. With us, it's like. You can't even do a nationwide thing because of the way our, you know, constitution is written up. It's got to be state by state. There, we have, I think it's like 31 states where the sex ed does not have to be medically accurate. So you could technically teach the stork and not get fired. Are you kidding me? Technically, you could teach the stork, not get fired. I think that, I mean, it, it, would, be, it would be a very bland version, but I think they just... Well, Sophia, my little stepdaughter, she's been through it. And it's just it's like about an hour. And they get told, you know, this is what intercourse looks like. Mm. And you're probably going to get pregnant. And <laughs> you're probably going to get an STI. And But no, like, you know, 
how to handle consent issues. Oh god. No, which is huge. We can you can't handle consent if you don't talk about sex for pleasure because yeah. as soon as you talk about sex not being just about babies, it's like, well, why else would you have sex if yeah. it's not about babies? Oh, because it can feel good. Oh, sometimes you don't want to do it with someone. Yeah, it's yeah. It's, There's a charity over here called Brooke, yeah. which I was an well, I still am an ambassador for. I just haven't done stuff. They're naughty me like very much <laughs> lately. But they are absolutely fantastic. And they their motto is sex is fun. That's why people do it. That's why kids do it so let's instead of trying to stop them remember what it was like back then when you were 14 15 hormones going bonkers and you know, let's just give them the information that they need let's give them a safe place to go where they can come and get condoms come and get the pill if they want it come and you know and it's a fantastic charity but by god you get some people like really anti it but they're the only people that have ever made sense about sex to me they if you sort of go online and look at them and their their um um ceo was the most fantastic speaker and he used to be inspired and he would make these speeches that really did make people change their minds about sex and you know the whole point of giving this access you know this information to young people to make their own choices well said i mean <laughs> i got- <laughs> i probably i can remember his name simon i can't remember now anyway he's not the ceo anymore so um but you know, we need organizations like that we need you know people to just say look remember when it was, I, mean, I remember being at something else and the guy from Durex was actually a really good speaker. And we were in this, um, this sort of like, I can't remember what it was, but it was full of all these like sex therapists. And honest to God, I sat there and I remember they all looked down on me because I don't know, I had on this like, um, navy blue dress with hot pink shoes and everybody else in the room, these women, they were about 50. They looked like grandmothers. They had gray hair. They just looked like they'd never had sex in their life. <laughs> and it was me and this Durex guy. And he was saying, come on, really, this is ridiculous. Like, can't you remember what it was like when you were 14? Can't you remember what it was like? And they all just... They're like, we still haven't had it, so we don't know. Well, <laughs> it's pretty much like that. <laughs> and just looked at my shoes. I might as well have just been talking in bloody Swahili because no one even listened to what I had to say. But you could see that all these people that were meant to be movers and shakers and sex educators had probably, they'd lost, they were so in their head in academic land about it all. Mm. And they'd forgotten about the pleasure aspect of it. And that is not going to get us anywhere, is it? It's really not going to get us anywhere at all. I can only imagine what it was like when you started. So uh, do you see a difference? Because like, um, you know, you are one of the original sex experts, you can say, right? Mm. And it's, um, do you notice the difference between your generation of, of sex educators and the new generation of sex educators coming up is there a difference maybe yeah, between fantastic difference yeah i mean the whole big thing that's um, changed is the internet isn't it we didn't have the internet I mean, we did a little bit but now i mean there are so many bloggers about sex i mean what you're doing is amazing oh, you know but you've fine. got to be bright enough to be able to find this stuff don't you but i mean there is some pretty good sex information out there i mean if you if you want to, I mean, most people are blogging about anything, aren't they? If you type in a topic on Google and you want to know about it, you can get you can get some sort of information about it. So, I think it's much. You can also same thing for uh, if you want any type of porn. Uh, yeah, yeah. The same thing. If you want to know all about antelopes, you can find out about antelopes. If you want antelope porn, you can also find yeah. antelope porn. It's very disturbing. And porn is another <laughs> another story. So there is some pretty good information out there, and it's much less judgmental. But girl, I mean, honestly, girls are still, I mean, I think it's very, this whole consent thing is really, really difficult for young women. And no one's talking about that because girls. I think it's, it's, it's difficult for everybody. I know as a dude, it's, it's a difficult thing. Yeah. But with porn and stuff, I mean, look, I've nothing against porn in lots of ways, but Jesus Christ, the fact (laughs) that kids are using that as sex education is what is with this the hitting of the clitoris right. they just smack women well they're not getting any of their context you know if, if you if your only sex education is porn then that's terrifying it is utterly terrifying and then boys are going out with girls and thinking that they're learning all, all you know about technique and there's no i mean the majority of porn is just crap it's yeah. just crap it's all done for what looks good on film you know good sexual technique you're not going to be able to see see it if you know if a guy's going down on mm-hmm. somebody you're not going to be able to see what he's doing i mean what they show is is all done for effect and it's just it's i mean it really worries me that men we've got all this breed of young men growing up to think that threesomes are the norm you know that women well, you know, are threesomes still... not the norm i'm sorry Wait, no, I'm kidding. Okay. <laughs> but that you know that all men all women are interested in is a big hard erection they're not interested in a big <laughs> direction half the time they want lots of foreplay they want i mean there is some good porn out there that's made by women for women and mm. you know with then sometimes that can go the other way but 
it's, you know, it's just horrifying. And if we've got porn, which is never going to go away, mm -hmm. it's never, ever going to go away. We've got to talk about sex. Yeah. It's just pointless. You got to contextualize like the, the, it. You know, what's that saying? The cat's out of the bag. We, you know, they're out. They're yeah. already watching sex at 10. Or a lot of people say, like, uh, if, if you only had Fast and the Furious movies, but no Driver's Ed, then you'd mm. have a bunch of fucking maniacs. Yeah. Driving cars off of cliffs. Yes. And that's exactly what's going but to happen. But Fast and Furious is fine when they have the context of, no, this is actually what driving is like. Um, that's just a movie. Yeah. Yeah. And then you've got social media, which is evil, I think, which is great <laughs> in lots of ways, isn't it? But it's evil for, I feel, I look at Sophia, who's under so much pressure and she's good looking, articulate, gregarious. And even she, you know, has that whole shit, do I look good enough? This FOMO, you know, fear missing out thing, mm -hmm. you know, having to look perfect all the time. There's so much pressure on young girls and boys and it's sort of, it's a weird society. There's too much uh. information of one type, not enough of another. And then this weird, well, if we just sort of pretend that kids don't like sex and still aren't having sex, it's like, what planet are we on? Just grow up, everybody. All these adults need to grow up. The kids are more grown up about sex than the adults these days. For sure. Yeah, uh, because they're reading more about it. Yeah. How's, how, how's the UK on trans and, and queer issues? I'm not too um, familiar. I was quite impressed that we went to a college which is sixth form which is what um so she'll be going there at 16 so a 16 year old so it's like a high school high, okay. high school -y type thing and there was a transgender loo i thought okay okay we're moving in the right direction then aren't we um it's a lot better than you'd think i mean certainly yeah i think it's, it's probably about the same as america really i mean People like Kate, well in America like, we're we're afraid, we're afraid that trannies are coming for our kids. Like that's, <laughs> seriously, uh, North Carolina has a is the state that's it has a very very strict bathroom law because bathrooms are a new battle. They lost in the chapel. Now they're attacking the bathrooms, oh, okay. and it's like they're losing businesses. Like uh, sports or the NCAA said they're going to do their championships in a different city outside of the state because of it. Because um, they don't joking. want they don't want people to use. Uh, the bathroom for the gender that they feel is theirs. Um, they want to do it all by biological sex, um, which is insane because then it requires somebody to have to go be like, show me your papers, which oh, is so yeah. ridiculous. Why can't they just put another loo in and just um, make it chat? I suppose sometimes that's not possible, but I do find this well, fear of homosexuality, of queer, of trans. What was wrong with who people? Who gives like, a fuck? Exactly. Why do people give a fuck? I always think it just means they've got their own issues that they're trying very hard to. And this whole, I mean, uh, this whole thing that because for some reason you're not with, you know, the standard norm of opposite sex, that suddenly because of that, you're going to become a kiddie fiddler or, you know, a, like trying a to. A fiddler? Yeah, a kiddie Did you fiddler. you say fiddler? Is that what they call them? Yeah, I know. Oh. <laughs> that makes it sound too adorable. I know, it crime. does a bit, actually. Oh. <laughs> I mean, I remember my um, at my first wedding, the MC guy was gay, and I remember my my um, the guy that I married, my um, husband. That's the word. Right, right. <laughs> I completely <laughs> forgot what that word was. His dad, right, who was really unattractive, right, is dead now, so I can say that. DJ was, keeps trying was, to bang me. Yeah. No, yeah, like, he was like, oh, he really fancies me. And he's like, well, that would be very odd because the guy who's the MC is very good looking, young man. Why <laughs> the hell would he be wanting to bang you? Why? <laughs> and why do people think this? I don't know where the logic comes from that they, oh, I just find it so strange. And what do people care? Why do they care? Do you watch um, Transparent? You know that? Not yet. It's on oh, my, it's, it's, on, so uh, it's on the list. Uh, it's yeah. absolutely brilliant. I thought that did so much. I don't know what I think about Caitlin. I only watched the first ever episode. She did a brilliant Vanity Fair piece. That was amazing. But the show, I don't watch any of that. Crap. Well, what's, what's sad is that um, <laughs> Caitlin has forced us to have to stand behind her on something, which is, is saying like, oh, look, she's a good... But no, no, no. She's still a shitty person. Like she's just a yeah. brave trans woman who's also a shitty Kardashian. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. It's difficult. It's just, it? it's very difficult. Yeah, because we want to be. We want to say like you're great and we support you, but you're also like everything yeah. that's wrong with this country. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> ba yeah. Basically, so it is difficult, isn't it? And I think she gets a hard time. I mean, the surgery. I mean, when people say well, it was all a big publicity stunt, I mean, when you read about the pain, I mean, it's not an easy process at all. It's such, and to have it's gone, like, I mean, it's a huge decision. I know maybe you using she, it for the money a bit. Or she, she was already the, famous. like Yeah. So what was the problem? She was already, already killing it. Yeah. So I, I do think, I mean, I do, I'm really glad I'm not mm. trans because I just think, um, or whatever the correct term is these days, um, I, I just think, 
that must be so difficult and so expensive and so painful. And people, there's lots of um, uh, people around here who are clearly going through the process. And it's quite polite around Notting Hill, which is where I live. You know, mm. we used to all sorts and no one blinks an eyelid about gay people anymore. But you can still, wherever they go, people stare at them. There's nudging. There's, I mean, what a bloody life. It's, you know, you'd want to be really committed to the decision. And we need to just grow up about things. We really do. Mm. I find it awful. We're so cruel as a society. And I don't think it's ever going to get any better. Uh, no, it's just they're going to keep finding new people to put yeah. down. Yeah, they you are. Know? Uh, whether it's by sexual orientation or gender, or even it's going to be something like, all right, now we got a thing again. We're going after the furries because we got yeah. no one else we can attack. We're going to go after the people who want to pretend to be kittens and fuck each other. All right. Yeah. That's who yeah. we're going for. Yeah. That's, um, that is the nature of the beast, isn't it? That's yeah, you can go after thing. fetishists, I guess. I mean, you guys have the um, really some some strict like BDSM laws, right? Or something. I, feel, I feel like I read, it was either here or Ireland, but I feel like it was here. They did a... a face sit in or face sit on like uh like in protest of like uh some law that like was outlawing certain kinks and they did like a protest where like they had women come and just sit on the faces of a bunch of dudes in protest <laughs> which i was like that's I hilarious saw, i don't know i missed that but i seem to miss <laughs> that i reckon it would have been ireland because their laws are pretty strict i mean they they still got their whole anti-abortion thing and mm-hmm. I mean, they, they are quite strict. But in America, I mean, they've got bizarre laws, haven't they? Where, you know, um, anal sex is still forbidden in certain... No, no, sodomy is now... Is uh, but But not until like the 2000s. Yeah. It was like the 2000s in Texas that was when they finally struck it down on a oh, federal it? level. But it was like, that's shockingly late. I know. It's shockingly ridiculous, late. isn't it? Yeah. Totally ridiculous. But... Um, yeah, so I don't know. Are we any more tolerant? I don't know. Will we ever be more tolerant? I don't know. I find mm. it all a bit depressing, you know, because I thought the generation, like my niece and nephew who are like 25 now, mm. that generation, I just thought, God, you know what? We're really getting it right, you know, because I lovely that they're having friendships between, you know, and, and I think there's, I was like, well, this is a lovely little generation that's coming up now and they seem to have really learned, they seem knowledgeable about sex, you know, they seem to really like each other. There doesn't seem to be that divide between male females or anything like that. How's that differ from when you were their age? Well, I think everybody like you, was, there like was still that whole man, you know, man, woman, it was, but forget even anything else interesting. It was still that sort of, you know, men are men and women are women and they're never going to be the same. And it was just mm. sort of the, you were never just friends with a man. There was always another, had to be an ulterior motive or anything like that. So I, I thought we were coming up to this generation. I thought this is going to be really great. We're, we're just obviously moving in the right direction. Humans generally are. And then all of a sudden, I don't know what happened. I think social media happened actually. Mm. And then all of a sudden, like I really worry about women. I know I'm harping on a bit about it, but I, I really do think that, because there was a time that I really worried about men. I thought men were being shafted big time. And now I think it's swung again. It's young girls that are being put upon. And, and um, actually, we were talking last night and a teacher who's teaching over here, a young um, student teacher was saying she was in a school. There was a group of like 10 or 11 year olds. And this, these, these kids, like she heard this young boy say, move out of the way, woman. To this other young student, you think, oh, really? You've been watching too many movies from what the seventies. What's wrong? I don't know. I don't know about (coughs) woman. What's a weird woman? You're still a little boy. Like you don't get to call anyone woman. Yeah. But then you just look at, and then you look at, you know, what's happening with you know nine year old boys ISIS shooting people, and you think, what the hell is going on? It's a horrible world at the moment. I think if everyone just start having more sex, you know, I feel like everyone would be in a better mood. Yeah, we would be in a better, yeah, better mood. Better life. How you doing, dude? Space. Just got laid. How you doing? Uh-huh. Just got laid too. Life's yeah. awesome. High five. Yeah. yeah. No need. To- well, we know that in marriages, isn't it? I mean, sex is so important for stress relief in yeah. so many different ways, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I, mean, I wouldn't know. I'm not. I'm not married. I just got my uh, first girlfriend a, first, a few a few oh, months ago. Why are you looking at your wrist when you say that? Because uh, pretend to look at a watch, but <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. It's like. Uh, yeah, I, I thought it was some significant wristband or something. Oh no, these are these are my wristbands for my orgies though. This one says uh, no photo, and this one says I consent to touch. They give How these hilarious. out. What? So you went to an orgy? I go to parties um, about like once a month, once maybe two every three months. Do you? Like that. So yeah. tell me what it's like. Cause I've never been. Oh, you've never been? No. You're the sex expert. You've never. I know, but you never I'm, just I'm went like... on a purely observational level. Be like like an ethnographer, just be like, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to take notes. I've done some pretty <laughs> strange things for that reason, but I've never been. Did I go? I've been to like a killing kittensy type. Killing thing. kittens. Yeah. yeah, I've heard about them. They, yeah, yeah, that's like a We're, high end. Yeah, yeah, oh, quite high. Posh end. type. But thing. I've never. Um, 
I've never, you know, I was thinking, do you know what it was? I think because, because I was one of the first, I was very um, conscious of sort of doing just the right image of being conservative. Like I was sort of non-judgmental. So sort of anything goes, but also not to that sort of extreme end of sex. So I sort of, was that on purpose or was that how you naturally were? That's how I probably naturally was, to Mm. be honest. Um, Because I'm not that promiscuous and I'm not, Mm. um, I'm I mean, I'm, dreadfully boring in terms of what I've done ha. sexually and stuff like not not with one but or with one person I'll do whatever with mm. you know like with one partner but I'm not I've never been into group sex I've never been into the, that sort of end and also I think I'm quite a good businesswoman so I knew that that was where if I just positioned myself as the slightly adventurous or the adventurous normal person in quotes adventurous to like the house mom yeah yeah the stay-at-home yeah. mom being like, oh, that's crazy. Whereas in like the Kingsters are like, oh, that's not. Yeah, yeah. Kingsters yeah. probably think I'm so bloody vanilla. It's just not even funny. Right. But that worked back then. Now it probably wouldn't work. I'd be seen as, I wouldn't position myself that way now if I was coming out, you know, it, it doing the same thing. How should one position themselves? I've got my notebook open. What now? Uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm always open for I this. I think you probably got about the right idea, actually. You were probably what I was back then. Well, I don't know. I, I mean, I kind of own the Google results on the word man whore, so. Yeah, well, that's pretty damn good. <laughs> but I think, um, so I very deliberately did do that and it made perfect sense because no, everybody else wasn't doing that. Mm. There was no one who was sort of positioning themselves where I was. So it made a big, big sort of, um, made perfect business sense. And I'm still like that. I've still always avoided doing, I'm very careful with who I'll let interview me. I'm very careful. I'm not interested in sort of that really, I don't know, that sort of extreme and because I don't mm. know that much about it. So if I'm going to, I, I would feel that I wasn't the right person to talk to about that sort of right. quite extreme end. But I am quite fascinated by the whole, the orgy thing appeals to me on many levels because I do think long-term sex is very hard to keep exciting. Mm. But if I, and I could do it if I was with somebody who I wasn't really into, but I'm such a jealous person when I'm totally in love that I couldn't, so I can see that well, with my partner. You, I don't, you also wouldn't have to play with us. others. Uh, I've had people, I had a couple reach out to me They said they were going to be in New York. They wanted to go to a party. I referred them to the party uh, I was going to that weekend. And they didn't want to play with anyone else. They just wanted to have have sex with each other in front of other people. Like uh, there's an exhibition streak um, that they wanted to go on. Yeah, that would appeal. But we're both so jealous that we'd be like, what the fuck are you looking at her for? What are you looking Uh, at her for? So I don't even think, because I reckon I probably could handle it better than him, actually. But, yeah, how so does he how does he handle being with the the sex expert? Was that because ever I'm like, was was that ever a thing when y'all first no, started dating? No, 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 because I'm old now. I mean, it would have been back along when I was doing like I used to get hit on a lot and get tons of. But I'm sort of like I'm 54 now, so it's probably and I've calmed down. Like I'm <laughs> I'm different. I'm not as hyper and sort of you know. So it's quite a nice nice sort of relationship and i don't flare anymore and because mm. i to be honest i think probably apart from my husband he's probably be the one that i'm truly in love with it's sort of quite a nice experience because i used to want to flirt with other people i was not right. very good at being faithful i have to say Ooh, is that, that is that what broke down the the first marriage no no no, no that was i don't know why yeah that was sort of a whole other whole, a lot of other stuff i got really sick with cancer and i changed i was becoming the big corporate you know girl at Cosmo and stuff like that. And it sort of made me rethink everything. And I thought, right, I'm just going to go back to basics and write because that's what I really love doing. And I sort of rethought my life. Meanwhile, he used to be a um, professional beach volleyball player and went to banking. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Can you just wait, wait, wait. Wait, what profession would you say that was again? Can you (laughs) repeat that? Beach volleyball player. I know know fathers in my country that would kick their sons out of the house if they said that that's what they wanted to pursue. Yeah, you could do that. I didn't know that that was even an option. Yeah, it is. Dad... I want to professionally play beach volleyball. Yeah. Get the fuck out of my house. <laughs> well, he's a Canadian. He's a Canadian. But yeah, he was really good sportsman. So we went in different directions. How'd you two him. meet? Um, at a party. He was great. Fun. Look, he, we, I'd, go, I'd go back and marry him all over again. Do you know what I mean? We were oh. really, really good. But, um, and different times, if, I'm, you know, if I'd met him now, we would never have got divorced, I don't think. But So we were really suited at the wrong time. And I was super ambitious. Mm. And I think he, you know... I'd, anyway, I was I was too restless. You didn't. Whereas go, now you, I'm fine. So you didn't go I see enough he, of his games. Is that yeah, <laughs> I reckon he would have. He didn't like it when I chose what I did because before, remember, I was editor of Cosmo, and right. then then going into writing about sex, I think he was not comfortable with that. Whereas Miles is just thinks it's quite amusing, really, and he's very proud of me. And you're writing about what now? 
different yeah. types of butt plugs. That's hilarious. That's adorable. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> My agent's funny because when she, um, she sort of was doing like, like representing me and I was writing um, sex books and my sex books are pretty tame. They, I mean, they're pretty good, but they're pretty tame. They'd be right. seen as tame now, but they are very, I mean, look, but I, it's see, still I, really good I, practical information. When they you say tame, I think it time. depends to yeah. whom? I think to the, to the, to the housewife who reads 50 shades of gray and her mind blows wide open, yeah, uh, despite wouldn't. how problematic the book is. Yeah. You know, I think that the, your book's, they're not at all tame to her, but yeah. like to my girlfriend and like her world of BDSM yeah. sex yeah, party they'd goers, very, yeah. they'd be like, yeah, we figured that out like 10 months ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. But they're still good practical information yeah. and, yeah. and they still sell really well. And they, um, you know, they're still relevant. Like there's no need to go back and sort of update. I mean, they, but I would approach it. There are always people having anal sex for the first time and yeah. they're always going to need yeah. your book. Yeah. To know how to do that. Yeah. Yeah. But I was just thinking then, how many are still bloody in print? I think the Kindle versions are still out there. Yeah. No, it was ages since I read a book. The bastard <laughs> of it is, is that no one bloody reads sex books anymore because they just go online. But they also so do audiobooks. I just, yeah. um, because I was reading over here. See, I'm a book person. I love, yeah, I, love I like the book as an artifact. I like yeah. to write in it. Um, depending on the history book, I'm, I'll put tabs in it. Uh, yeah. And, and I love the bookshelf. Yeah, I like I having it as my trophy case. See, that's the trouble with yeah. social media and stuff is, and the fact that everything's digital. You used to be able to walk into somebody's house and you could look at their record collection. You'd look at their books. Yeah. You could figure out who the hell they were very easily. Now, I mean, uh, I suppose you have to look on, but it's all out there, isn't it? I don't want, I don't want to look at their media. Kindle. I don't want, no. I don't want to look at what you liked on Facebook. No. Just let me come in and see it. Yeah. Uh, so I love, like, I love a big bookshelf like that. Yeah, That's, me too. And it yeah. looks good. I think it really looks good, a big bookshelf. And I'm not good at decorating. So like just having a big, the more books I read, the more books I put in, the bigger the yeah. bookshelf, the more I've decorated now. <laughs> but, so, it's but true though. People still will devour books. It's just so different. Cause like me, yeah. I still do. So I'm reading, I just, I'm finishing this. Oh yeah. Right? Sex with um, Shakespeare. Gr- it's, it's it's, it's brilliant. It's um, it? a lot of like sex, but it's a memoir. And yeah. I don't even like memoirs. No, I don't. So many memoirs are like self important. Oh, right? I love Dan Savage. Right? Oh my god. I, I did a little show with him and I loved him. Yeah. I'm in love with him. <laughs> He's amazing. <laughs> So, like, I read this. And Ian Kern is amazing as well. Mm -hmm. He's another one I have on a a list of people to be checking out. Oh, he's fantastic. Have you done Dan yet? He follows me on Twitter, but I would love to have him on the show. He's He's in New York often. And uh, even if he said, like, yo, you have to come to Seattle, I'd be like, I'll go to Seattle. Yeah. Yeah, I I thought he lived in New York. No, no, he lives in Seattle. God, he's um, so good looking and his boyfriend. I was just like, oh, my God, I'm coming back as a gay man. A really good looking (laughs) gay man. That's what I'm coming back as. Well, from what I've heard, they like a little, they're monogamish and like, you know, so they yeah. can have a little doubt. If you come back as a game and you could totally get them. <laughs> okay. totally get them. But, but so but on the books, like I'll, I'll buy, I'll buy the physical book and yeah. I read it. But my girlfriend, she just finished this yesterday. Audio book. Yeah. So oh. she listened, um, for like 12 hours to Jillian well, read the audio. I'm just like, ugh. Like I no. like podcasts, but the book is such a, I don't know. It's a little, it's more intimate no. for me. I, I need, got it. Yeah. I'm visual. I want to be able to read, but I like, um, I do like, cause I've got so many books here now. I yeah. just have no more space and I bought a Kindle for travel and now I'm addicted to that because <laughs> it's just, you could just have 5 million books on one little device. And it's lovely. Yeah, but and you know, author, when the monkey... people say you're an author, what are you doing? And it's like, well, authors get more from digital books, you know. They do. Yeah. Oh. So you're not selling out. So many people are like, oh, God, sorry, I've got an, a Kindle. It's like, doesn't worry me. It doesn't make any difference. Just keep reading. I'm just saying when the monkeys take over and all the electronics mm. go dead, I'm going to still be able to read. Uh, I know. I just yeah. asked somebody the other day. I was like, <laughs> is it, is, could the internet ever go down? Yeah. Well, what, it would just destroy the whole society. Why don't terrorists just take the internet down? That's what I'd do. Yeah, stop using Twitter. Just end Twitter. If they could yeah. figure out a way to end Twitter, they'd do way more damage. Well, they would. Or, or Snapchat now, isn't it? Poor old Twitter's being left behind, isn't it? Uh, well, no, people are still on Twitter, I right. hope, because I'm... I'm that, on Twitter. <laughs> Twitter's like my thing. I don't have Instagram. Yeah. I'm, I don't, I'm not, oh, I like Instagram. I'm, well, I'm not a photo... I, I'm, I'm selectively photogenic. So oh. I feel like... It, yeah, well, I don't think yeah. I always look good in pictures. Yeah, but you don't have to put pictures of yourself. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I don't know. I don't like doing pictures. I like looking at something and then mocking it in 140 yeah. characters. <laughs> That's how I prefer to, yeah. to devour yeah, it. Yeah, better, aren't they? So you're saying the, the, the first husband wouldn't have been as cool with the, the books and with the sex stuff, but uh, no. Miles is, is chill with it. Yeah, Miles is chill. Yeah. He's good. He's good for that. But yeah, I don't reckon we met each other at the right time because I, I think he would have been highly threatened 
back along. When he was like, in a, if he was a thirty year old Miles, with yeah, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have worked. Now and he's lived life; he's confident, yeah, doesn't give yeah, a shit. Yeah, he's like, yeah. I, I do what I do. I got yeah. my moves. And certain <laughs> guys that I went out with were really proud of me and, lo- and liked it. Because they saw me, because I, I think I'm a businesswoman as well yeah. as a, a sex person. And so I think they realize that it's just my job, you know, and that's what I'm doing. And, yeah. I, and also something I'm really passionate about and I believe in it. So if you know me, you know that I'm never going to talk about anything or do anything that I don't believe in. So, yeah. so you know, they either admired that or found it very threatening. I think men generally are quite threatened by strong women. I don't think that's good. Strong, right. sexual, good in bed women who know mm. what they want and know what to ask yeah. for. That's got to be frustrating if you're bad in bed. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, exactly. And that's what it comes down to. But I'll tell you one thing. I've, I honestly don't. I've never wanted to have a penis. I reckon you really got the short end of the stick to have a penis because women can get away with anything. But if you would, I, if I had a penis, I reckon I'd have proper erection performance problems. Because if you get nervous, you know, you you it's all out there, isn't it? Well, it must be really difficult. I would say I was more embarrassed about it like when I was younger, but then again, when I was younger, it would happen far less. Um, not that younger is that much younger, yeah. but I think just in as part of it was like in meeting people through doing the show and going to parties is I learned, oh, there's so, and listen to Dan Savage, yeah. is there's so many other things I can do. Yeah. So if I do go soft or if I can't get hard, if we're having fun, I just don't let that end the fun. I'm like, okay, I'm going to use my mouth or my fingers. Or yeah. But you're... you're sexually educated, right? Right. But the as average as... guy still has his whole bloody, you know, right. self-esteem all tied up with how hard he can get, which is just utterly ridiculous. Right. But if we had proper sex education yeah, where people yeah, learn yeah. like that, there are other types of sex besides penis in a place um, you'd have so much more fun. Even soft penises, you can have fun. Yeah. Um, you know, you take like a vibrator. We've recently learned not a Hitachi. Penises cannot handle Hitachi. <laughs> no, too there was strong. a bad injury. And, uh, what, really? Yeah. Really? I, I bro- oh. kind of like semi broke my penis for like a week. It was. How? <laughs> Girlfriend got her first Hitachi. She brings it over. Yeah. Uh, we fool around. We decided like trade off. Like she, she masturbates with the Hitachi really hot than I take and we were going to do uh, like frenulum stimulation. I love me a good frenulum, no stroke orgasm. Very, very intense, very fun. When you're just stimulating that, you don't even stroke it. It's just over and over on that one spot until you explode. Great. So we were like, let's do it with the Hitachi. And it was, uh, it was too much for me to handle. So afterwards, um, there was just this like line of a wound. Like it just, it looked. (laughs) Well, it just got really, the, well, so I, I'm circumcised. So that entire oh, scar, sorry. it wasn't just sore. Like it looked like the the first crack in the pavement in the ground before Why hell didn't you stop before it got breaks sore, out. Um, I, I didn't notice till afterwards. Like it hurt a little bit, but it felt good. And then I was like, oh, and I looked down. I'm like, oh my god, shit, I broke it. <laughs> Bloody hell. Um, but, oh, painful. But in general, like, yeah, like if you would teach guys like, hey, you can have an orgasm without even being mm. hard just with like mm. a safe well, vibrator. Like there's so many own... things to do yeah. and you don't have to even be hard to do them no. and they can be fun. And also it's normal. Like so many yeah. older men get so hung up on the fact that they have erectile dysfunction. It's like, oh, for God's sake, it's just your penis getting old. Like yeah. the rest of you, you know, just calm down about it. Even Adrian Peterson gets injured and he can't run touchdowns anymore. Yeah. That's an American yeah. football yeah. guy. Yeah. Um, I get the analogy, yeah. But that is exactly the case. So, we, you know, the more information about stuff like that, the better. And yeah. and I think that's the other problem is that because of porn and because everybody is so, I mean, porn is just beyond, I mean, you can, like you said, antelope porn, you can type in anything. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, how can a long-term relationship possibly compete with porn when you can get like an instant image of any you know so much variety so much and, and men i think what happens when you're older looking at the old, mm. other end of sex is that you get men who start to get erection problems and it's just so it's they're too embarrassed to talk to their partner so instead they just start ha- you know there's their sex then becomes private sex because you don't need an erection as you said to have an orgasm yeah. so they just go in they watch porn have an orgasm and that's it and then the poor old wife's you know or partner is left out and that's it yeah you know between but it's it's a game because we're not talking about it. But this obsession with an erect penis with men, I just find it extraordinary. Let's take a brief moment to do the impersonal Patreon thank you roll call. Yes, this is the part of the show where I like to thank everyone who supports me and the work that I'm doing here on Patreon. Uh, Patreon is a lot like a monthly fan club subscription. You get a lot of cool rewards like bonus episodes and thank you videos and shout outs on the podcast. I'm so excited to say that uh, we reached a all-time new high in monthly pledges, $378 pledged this month. 
Holy shit, thank you all so fucking much. You have no idea how helpful that is. I can finally buy shoes that don't have holes in them. <laughs> um, so thank you. I want to say thank you right now to everybody. Thank you so much to Jennifer C and to SB and Lance S and Madeline B, Jazzo, Jeff C, Dave K, Justin C, Ramon F, Sarah S and Sarah B, Prickly Peach, Lawrence B, Holly F, Christina D, Greg A, Sean B, Andrew R, Meg Zen, Ed B, Anna. Keep going, super slut. Gregory Y. from the Bowery Boys Podcast, Nicole M., Frank D., Jackie S., Doug R., Millie W., Michael P., Danielle G., Jeremy B., Stuart A., Jessica K., and we're halfway there. Brian W., Danielle D.P., Ashley C., Catherine B., Chris with a K., Ben W., The Naked Man, Charles G., Todd B., Alex S., Chris W., Lauren M., Derek N., John S., Sean N., Dervla, Raphael R, Dave P, Scott B, Toby T, CJK, Mark G, Steve Dean, and oh man, we're almost there. Emily S, Julian D, Ashley J, Rachel O, and Jeff Z. Shout out to Jeff's wife uh, for telling him to increase his pledge from a dollar a month to five dollars a month. Much appreciated, sir and lady. <laughs> uh, thank you all so very much. And you too can join dozens of listeners by becoming an official fan whore on Patreon. You can pledge as little as a dollar per month, and you can alter your pledge at any time. To do so, go to manwhorepod.com and click the Patreon banner on the side. Or you can download the Patreon app, and you can find me on there. That's Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And here's a note for existing patrons uh, from, from Millie W. If you have moved and need to change your address, uh, to do so, go to your pledge settings, click Change Your Pledge, then there will be an option to change your address. Just a little helpful hint. And now, let's get on back to Tracy Cox. Did you have to educate Miles, or did Miles show up properly educated? Um, I think every you always educate the person you're with, don't you? Because well, you're educating about, about yeah. you and your personal likes and needs, yeah. but like as a general rule, like I like to think I'm like somewhat educated. I can come in at a good mm. base level. Yeah. Now you can fine tune the details. Um, but like you know, some yeah, people it was more like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think I'd go out with somebody who was that thick about sex. Right. I think you'd sort of you'd figure it out pretty quickly. But the you? sad thing is I feel like right now people, like I don't know, like the confident people, men and women in bed, need to do a little bit of teaching to the ones who didn't. Oh, you don't like the <laughs> disco ball effect of it? Yeah. No, it sometimes gets in your eyes. I've got a shiny thing on the table that looks good, but it can be a bit annoying on your eyes. Uh, um, yeah, we do need to educate. But I mean, we, we're inching towards progress. mm I think, uh, you know, people are a lot more sexually educated. I mean, Christ, when you think about our grandmothers, I mean, they wouldn't have known. But Christ didn't even know what a clitoris was. Oof. You know, so so now we, we there's don't hope put, Don't put there. grandmother and clitoris in the same <laughs> sentence for me. Oh, hang on. There's somebody Go at the door. It. Go for oh, it. That's fine. How, uh, how, how's the, how did the brother uh, feel and family feel about you getting to <laughs> sex education and being the face of British sex? <laughs> um, I think they were fine about it, actually. Yeah. I think they, um, my mum's quite funny because obviously whenever I'd write a book, I would send them the books and, and in mum's like, um, lounge room, she's got all these sex books and she said, I mean, it's quite, it's got my name on it. So anybody right. can figure it out that actually her name wasn't Cox at the time. So, um, she I think, ever just be like, Hey, you missed, you need to <laughs> add this one in there. Here's a tip. Well, actually it was quite interesting because she, um, got a new partner at about, Gosh, my brother's in there probably with his fingers in his ears now. Um, <laughs> because she got a new... I think my mum really discovered sex. I don't think my dad was that great, actually. But I think my mum discovered sex at about... She would have been... Would have been when I'd just written the first book. And I remember her coming down... I lived in Sydney at the time. She came down to Sydney and she was... She said, oh, I can talk to you about all this stuff now because you write all these books. And I was just like, oh, my God. Just because I write all these books, no one <laughs> wants to hear about their mother. <laughs> and actually, I remember telling Nigel, Mum, I didn't sort of betray her confidences, but telling him that she was telling me quite explicit stuff. And he was like, oh, my God, that's just wrong, isn't it? So it's sort of funny, but I think, yeah, proud. Really, I think because of my big sister um, growing up, working at family planning, I think there was, you know, we were always quite mm. cool about sex. I don't think my parents were ever uptight about it. So yeah. it was never, I mean, not that we, we weren't any of those hippie they, families they, or anything like that. Did they but, ever like uh, walk in on you or like catch you? Well, I was, I was 15 by the time right. they broke up. So 
I think no, no, I've never never had either because I hadn't had sex by that point, so right. they'd already broken up. And no, I think I mean, Mum was a bit too liberal though. I do remember yeah. my my mum being because you know when parents divorce, especially back then, I mean, it was a big deal when parents divorced back yeah. then. Yeah, it's making me sound like I'm about eighty five. <laughs> but um, she, I remember like her, she would try and be so cool and so sort of my friend. And I remember like I she she never because I used to have loads of boyfriends. She'd she'd come in and say things like, you know, oh, okay, darling, would you want to stay over the night? You're welcome to stay. And I was thinking, don't Tracy, don't this. forget to tickle the balls. <laughs> would you want to like that? <laughs> but it was like, mum, I don't want them to stay over the night. What the hell are you doing? You're almost like fast forwarding this relationship before I'm even ready. So she was almost too cool. But, you know, she was, she was great. I wouldn't change anything like that. But yeah, so I think they're all cool about it. I'm sure... Probably would have been a lot easier if I was, uh, you know, interested in something else. But mm-hmm. no, they're all very proud. I don't think I've embarrassed too many of them. When you first uh, got together with Miles, was that ever like a thing with the the stepdaughter? That no, she thought it was hilarious. She thought it was great. Yeah, yeah she loved it. And so, and does she come to you when she's yeah. got questions and whatnot? Yeah, yeah she does. And the mum's cool about that too. She's like, okay, you're the expert. You talk to her about sex. And I think we used to be, we used to have these discussions where she'd say, look, I'd say, look, I'll look over there and you look over there and then we can talk about it. Cause she was a bit like, oh God, this is feeling freaky. But now she's really cool about it. Mm. And, you know, and I'm probably very handy to have around, aren't I? Really? I'd imagine. Yeah. Is there a topic you don't feel confident or as an expert on when it comes to sex? Mm. When you're talking about like the super kinky extreme men, yeah, because yeah, because I, I, I haven't done half of it ever. Okay, so um, I mean, I didn't sleep with a, I slept with a woman once, mm. and that was when I was forty five or something. And oh, I, thought, Look, I better do this. <laughs> Just so, well, what was the motivation behind that? <laughs> because I'd never done it. Just because. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I just thought, well, let's just see what this is all about. So, so it was quite interesting. How, how was it? It was good. It was sort of it about. was an interesting experience because i remember thinking shit actually i had new appreciation for women's bodies out there i think i think it's easier for us to stimulate men than it is for i think women's bodies oh 100 yeah 100 percent. yeah yeah so i thought <laughs> i thought i'd be brilliant at like something like oral sex and i don't think i particularly was so i was like okay then right all this stuff I've been doing, clearly a lot of it's practice. Right. So it was interesting. Yeah, it was interesting. It was sort of interesting. Yeah, it was an interesting experience, but I'm not gay. And I'd, I'd always had like loads of female fantasies, but I'd never, I never ever thought I was gay. But I mean, I just thought this would be interesting to see how I get on with this. How'd so you, it was good for curiosity reasons. How'd you meet the uh, the woman? How'd that go down? Um, it was with a, a boyfriend and probably well, oh, the never yeah it was with a boyfriend okay. and we hired somebody so i thought that was the only way around. oh you hired yeah. some okay yeah. i thought that was the and also the reason why because like i said i'm quite a jealous person was that i really wasn't into him that much i really liked him but oh. i wasn't so there was going to be no jealousy involved so that's why i thought god might as well do it now or never and he of course like had never done it well not of course had never done it but he had done it but i just thought well you know why not do it. See now, I, I've of course heard of plenty of people using sex workers, but it's not a common thing you'll hear a woman yeah. talk about hiring a sex worker, yeah, or hiring a call to girl. Me, it's or escort. like the yeah. logical way to do it. To do a threesome, yeah, yeah. It's just sort of a yeah. lot of people won't. A lot of women won't admit that out loud. They about buying for sex is this attitude of like, why would I buy something I could totally get for free? Well, I just think that's all you ridiculous, know? isn't it? Right? I wanted to have control of the situation. If you want to have control of the situation, it's much better to do it that way. Yeah. And also, you wouldn't want to do it with somebody and pretend that you would, you know, because that's the other thing, I think, because I've got lots of gay girlfriends who say what really pisses them off is when you get like straight girls who just want to experiment, pretending that they, you know, are up for more than just a quick shag and and then sort of lead them along. And then they've sort of thought there was going to be more. And so I thought just it's more honest, isn't it, to do it like that? Awesome. Uh, I bring up the sex work stuff because I I've had on a guy. He's a male escort. He's a straight male escort yeah. for women. Yeah, and you know he has plenty of clients. I know female yeah. women yeah. who pay him to bang, but yeah. uh, the, you know you don't hear women talk openly. You'll hear dudes talk about getting a hooker or stuff like that. No, but, you, know, you don't hear no, about you women don't, doing actually. Yeah. I I did an interview with a guy who who lives here actually he's an Australian guy and he's um doing a roaring trade with women but I think he still does men as well I don't mm-hmm. think it's that 
many. But uh, I mean, that, I hate that whole thing where I could get sex anywhere. It's sort of like, well, there's a specific reason why you would use a sex worker. I mean, so I mean, with certain couples who perhaps want to try something, it, you know, a little bit extreme, and you know, I can sort of understand that if you don't want to do it, like, like hang on, let me start that again. Uh-huh. I know some couples who one of them has wanted to do something like maybe maybe BDSM or something like that, that their other partner's not really not interested in. And it's been a bit of a deal breaker for them. And so I, I remember counseling one couple and saying, look, and, and also this guy hadn't even done it yet. And he was prepared to leave his wife because she wasn't that interested. And I just mm. thought, this is just ridiculous. Just hire a sex worker or go to a club and just try it yeah. with her permission and see whether you bloody like it or not because you might not even like it. And that's exactly what he did. And he was like, oh, actually. We've been silly to get divorced over, you something know. Something you don't even, haven't even tried. Yeah. So so that was, I think he did hire a sex worker. So, I mean, to me, that makes perfect sense. And that, they, and that was all. He said, oh, okay, well, I am just happy with this, you know, sort of mild end. And I don't necessarily need to, you know, run off and find somebody who's been to be really... I mean, that's the thing also, isn't it, with sex, is that what's great in, in your head, fantasy and reality are just miles and miles apart. Right. Nearly always miles and mm-hmm. apart. So be careful what you wish for a lot of the time. I'm in, I'm in that position right now. I've got like a particular fantasy. My girlfriend and I both share a fantasy, yeah. we realized. And logistically, it seems difficult. And uh, I'm I'm worried that when we actually do it, I'm going to realize I'm, I'm so not into it. But, <laughs> but like, well, you probably won't be. Yeah. So do a little. We're going to give it. We're going to give it a try. Yeah. Um, was there anything else you've tried that you did just like just because either for the research or just to give it one shot go and it was, it was no. Nothing. And I think I'm like I said. I think I'm yeah. quite. I'm quite vanilla. Yeah. I am quite vanilla. But. When somebody said, I mean, you don't have to have done everything to be able to, you know, talk expertly about it. Like I could write a book on anorexia without having to be Mm. an anorexic. I mean, and also if I've never done it, what I did do was made sure I talked to tons of people who have. So if I was going to, when I wrote about, um, you know, gay sex, my first book, I just got tons. I did so much research Mm. with gay women and talked to them and said, well, how does it work with this? And how does it work with that? And and same with anything that I haven't tried. So you don't need to have tried things to be able to write about them. But, you know, it certainly helps if you've spoken to people who have, and it certainly helps if you have. But with most of the stuff I had done it, you know, because my books are quite mainstream. So it was sort of quite easy to to talk about things like that. And anything I hadn't done, I just called in experts. Like when I, my first ever guide to, um, oral sex i i spoke to this woman in um australia who was known as a she was like meant, meant to be the best um you know woman at fellatio that she's the was, best blow job in, yeah. in the whole and so the whole i just country. hired her for an hour <laughs> and interviewed her and she told me all there was to know which i have to say wasn't even that that exciting i mean she was pretty good though how, how much is there really to know with blowjobs like i feel like it's simple enough i could give a blowjob if like forced into it yeah yeah it probably is. But I mean, she, she, what she did was, you know, she, she had thought it through so mm. well. I mean, she had all the, she had all the tricks down pat, which, and she was quite happy to, you know, so I put her name in the book, I think. Did I? I can't remember. Um, and, um, you know, and just gave me all her secrets, basically. So I wrote that down. So that's, that's why I think the books mm. were popular because, and also the other thing, when I was right researching the book, a lot of those sex books with their techniques, they don't even work. They've got them all wrong. <laughs> well, you know, I that's where a lot of us have beef with the Cosmo. Yeah, um, it was bullshit half the saying. I got all my friends to try them out. My brother actually would say, <laughs> this doesn't even work. Put your hand here. That's not even actually impossible. So I got every <laughs> single technique. I got people to test it out to make sure that it wasn't bullshit. Well, there's the one where the one Cosmo used to do for forever was like putting the finger like on the on like the taint and put pressure yeah and that was just their way of saying like we can't tell you to put a finger in your butt because this is a magazine and it's yeah. too risky for them we're going to tell you to go near it and yeah, i was like no it you guys if you put uh, your hand like if someone puts like the really finger be- between the whole, the hole and the and the yeah. balls yeah and just put pressure it's un- i don't know i find it uncomfortable i'm like you're you're half an inch <laughs> away keep going yeah yeah the other one i saw was they did uh yeah they do used to did used to talk about that a lot right the perineum the perineum right and i felt like they were using the perineum as a way of like say like to signal prostate play yeah but that prostate play was too risque probably was for for it right yeah not so much but now i think it's gone better but there i remember reading one in college that it was stack a bunch of stack donuts on his erect penis then eat the donuts around the cock and then you can go down and i'm like please never 
please do that zero times. Please don't. Oh, How no. about you just buy me donuts and blow me while I eat them? That yeah, sounds that, actually way better. That, that sounds a lot better. <laughs> I do remember. Yeah, they did use to write rubbish. Oh. And you think, God, bloody hell, do people... But I don't, did anyone actually do those things? Surely not. Sadly, I bet you people... Just like you, we say porn is a lot of dudes' sex education, there's some women who, like, they take those Cosmo yeah, tips yeah, to heart. Yeah. Is it still going, Cosmo? I suppose it is, probably. Cosmo's still going, but they're better. Like, I remember a couple of years ago, they did their first, like, 12 women lesbian sex positions and i was living with a lesbian at the time and we were like okay cosmo you're getting there yeah yeah coming along <laughs> finally doing this Christ, yeah. good for you it's only 2014 yeah. but good job yeah, yeah yeah it's about time yeah, yeah they are quite funny they were good at packaging stuff then she was pretty amazing helen Gurley brown a lot of lists mm, a lot of lists also but i know practical, practical practical right. practical so when i'm doing my research on you i'm like wow a lot of lists uh lists yeah. are big mm, <laughs> mm. <laughs> I like lists. I'm the list maker, honestly. Um, my brother used to take... I'm talking about my brother a lot, by the way, not because I'm obsessed with him, because he's in he's the He's in the room. other room, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and um, I literally used to... I still have a list of every single day. I have a little list of what to do. And he used to take my list and write, turn hot tap on, turn cold tap on, turn hot tap on. Like just the extreme minutiae of, of my day it was like, wash hair. It's like, you're going to remember to do that, Trace. You don't have to write down to wash your hair. Tracy Cox's 13 ways to have a great day. <laughs> yeah. And that's, yeah, that's your list. Like must do this, transfer on, transfer on to the next day. Hilarious. So I am a list pest, but I like a good list. Yeah. Lists are good. You like a good 22 ways to do a thing? Yeah, I okay. do. <laughs> and I think people like, I think with sex, it they like, the reason why my books were successful because they were practical. Mm. And I think there's a lot of talk about like, you know, sex and and I, I all these like books that were out there before it'd be like this is how you know this is how you give a great blow job and but there was no like and i'd get people say but but then do i suck or do i blow or what, what do you mean like put right. it in your mouth there's no and i used to say right really specific list did yeah. you if you like they were really put your hand here make sure your mouth's like this and then what you're doing inside and practice this and and no one had done that before and so you know and I remember doing an interview in Ireland, actually, one of my first radio interviews, and this guy who's dead now, actually. And, uh, <laughs> he's, yeah, no, he was Jerry. I can't remember his name. He died of a heart attack. But he was really risque. He got the best blowjob ever from someone who read your book, gave him a heart attack. <laughs> yeah, probably. Put that on the book jacket. Yeah. But I remember like, I'd been hired. I was living in Australia. And I'd just written Hot Sex, and I was hired by my book publisher. So that was in the days when you just sit in a booth and um, do radio interview after radio interview after right. radio interview. And um, so this guy was an Irish guy and he said, well, you've, you know, you, your book's been a big hit and you, you've actually written, you know, how to masturbate for women. And you know, surely they know how. And I said, no, they don't know how. They really don't know. And he said, well, take me through it. And I'm thinking, shit, how explicit do they want me to be? So I literally did go, right, well, you put some lube on and then you do this with this finger and that with that finger. And honest to God, he said, I can't tell you, this switchboard is just going bananas with people going, why is she talking about this, blah, blah, blah. But also people saying, oh, my God, I, I've just I never no known how to do that. Like, I can't believe someone's actually told me what to do. I've never known it. Who the church ask? just told me if I prayed for it, I would get an <laughs> orgasm. Yeah. So, But no information, right. no information. And, um, and I, mean, I mean, I think, you do need practical information. So yeah. a good list is good. All right. Yeah. What's, uh, what's, what, oh, the other thing I was going to say was, uh, so were there ever during the, like, your 30s and 40s when you were out dating and you're the sex expert, mm -hmm. were there almost expectations of the men who made it past the bookshelf? <laughs> uh, were, were there I almost, think, did you feel like there were uh, the yeah, higher expectations for what you were going to be like in bed? Very high expectations. And I used to get performance anxiety because I used to think, my God, they think that I'm really being made. And I think lots of people thought, were quite disappointed that I wasn't as adventurous as what they thought. Well, not I'd even on the to. adventurous part, but like on the quality, like they were expecting the best blowjob or the best fuck right, of their life. How do you life. know I didn't deliver? I don't know that you didn't. I'm not doubting. I, I'm think, just, I think that, but I think, yeah. There was I think LeBron still anxiety. feels uh, anxiety before he gets on the court. I feel like he's the best yeah. basketball player, but he's like, yeah. they're expecting the best from the best. I got to go give them the best. Yeah. I do think, yeah, I do think that people probably had very high expectations. And I used to get a bit paranoid in the start where they'd be quizzing, like, the guys I went out with, I think everybody used to say, what was she like in bed? What was she like in bed? So I don't know. I mean, they used to say it was good, but who would know? Huh. Who would know? But there was something else I was going to say after that. Um, oh, I can't remember now. Something to do with what was it like to go out with? Um, anyway, <laughs> forgotten, gone straight out of the head. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but also, oh, actually, no, that's what I was going to say. The best answer was when somebody said, oh, what's it like to go out with Tracy Cox? And he said, I don't go out with Tracy Cox. I go out with Tracy. 
And I just thought, ooh, I so like good. that. She I like that. Dumped him. <laughs> no, I like that. No. Yeah, because it was because it was like, well, I'm just like that's a Hollywood else, answer. Really. That's what like a Hollywood A lister says when he's asked like an yeah. existential question. Yeah, it's a Hollywood. <laughs> actually, it's probably where he got it from. Ah. But um, <laughs> but anyway, what's uh, so what's there next you for you? Well, interesting because I've gone from um, being a journalist, like, and then writing books, and then writing columns. Then being in TV, on TV, radio shows, and now I do a range of sex toys, which mm-hmm. is, as we were saying earlier, probably very wise because everything else that I did, now everybody does for free, really. And no one reads sex books anymore. I think, I thought, in my head... People my, putting out free podcasts like yeah, idiots. exactly. That's idiots. why you go to patreon.com slash man whore podcast, make a pledge, people, please. Yes, uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> because no one gets any money. I think it's disgusting, actually, that we expect everything for free. I think it's really Started disgusting. with Napster. I, I know, I know. And it's. I think it's disgusting. And, mm. and, you know, people should be paid. Journalists should be paid. And I think it's disgusting. But I think in my head, what I thought I was going to do was start writing novels. Not necessarily sexy novels, but okay. novels. And I was rubbish at it. And I was never been so horrified in my life. Because everything that I've loved doing, I'm normally good at. You know, most people are, aren't they? Yeah. And I think what happened was that with, you know, digital books and everything, publishing just sort of was going through a really rocky time. So the standard was so high. And I think also I'm quite lazy now because I've worked so hard. I just thought, shit, I'd actually have to go. I thought it would just come naturally to me because I thought if you've written a nonfiction book, I don't know why I thought that fiction would be so easy. It's completely different. And I wasn't very good. And I had a couple of attempts. So I was really devastated. (laughs) And I could just get off my ass and actually go to a school and, you know, learn how to write a fiction book. So I know Mm. how to write, but I don't know how to write fiction. But it would take, I mean, to write, I don't want to write a crap book. I want to write a really good book. And it would really mean five years of really working hard, I think. And I don't know if I could be bothered doing that. So at the moment, I have to say I'm just sort of floating. But I do feel like I need to do something. I need to do – because I've got so much knowledge. I should be able to do something with it. So maybe I'll probably come up with a good nonfiction book idea. But there's no money in it anymore, the Mm. book. So it would be purely done for love. So who knows? More TV maybe? Hate do, I hate you hate doing the I TV? I always hated doing TV. Ooh. I didn't mind. I like the process of it. I like, I like changing people's lives. But I, I mean, I do lots of morning shows and stuff like that. But it's, it's I guess, TV, TV. <laughs> I mean, in intelligent, I mean, I, but my agent takes me along to these meetings and I'm like, this is never, this, this is a really intelligent idea. It's never going to get commissioned. Mm-hmm. And it never does. The crap ideas I don't want to do get commissioned and the really intelligent shows that would actually be great to do and I would do never get commissioned. Who so. do you think uh, is doing a good job with sex on TV? Oh, n- who? I don't know. Do you know anyone? I mean, obviously Dan Savage doing yeah, great. Yeah, he does we a like great him, job. But. Intelligent sex. He talks about intelligent sex. I mean, the thing is, I did do a show on sex that was called Sex Inspectors and what we did was we we put cameras, infrared cameras in the bedroom and then just cameras around the house and they were told, the couple were told to just behave normally and then we would sit there, myself and this American guy actually called Michael um, Alvia and we would watch these tapes and you couldn't see anything. It was the least sexy show mm-hmm. you've ever seen in your life because, you know, you couldn't sort of see anything that was going on and we'd analyse what, you know, tell them where they were going wrong and all this sort of stuff. But the most interesting thing about the show was the relationships because you could see the arguments going yeah. on and all the other shit that was influencing their sex life. And that was really interesting. But it's very hard to get sex right. You either come across as really twee or because you can write about sex really well. So that's mm-hmm. not a problem. But talking about sex is okay. But if you actually have to visually show sex, unless you're just a talking head talking about sex, which, right. is, which is what this woman is, to actually do it where it's not pornographic and it's not sleazy and to get real people to talk about it. This show that we did, people only watch the really good looking ones. If they, someone was ugly, they'd like, I'm not, watching this. I'm not watching this. They didn't care. It's just all about good looking people. And so it's very hard to get right. Mm. So I think TV and sex are two relationship shows are easy, but sex shows are very hard to get right. And just the crap they put on <laughs> these days, they try everything's that reality, you know, and it's, it's just too commercial and yeah. it's just nah all right <laughs> no no tracy cox reality show no no thank you with the with quite the quite private about i mean i'm open you know i think i'm reasonably open about stuff i've uh, I, your wikipedia page says something along the lines of like not much is known know. about tracy cox i know i don't I'm know like, who wrote that i was like i don't know what, what am i getting into here is she gonna be very <laughs> <laughs> yes i'm not talking about this or that it- i am quite open about it but i mean i'm not a person who's yeah. interested in 
private. I mean, I've been asked to go on Celebrity Get Me Out of Here and all that lot, and I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. It's me. That, I'd rather you were going to do that. Nails. That looks fun. No, no, hate stuff like that. I'm very private, really. Okay. I talk about what I want to talk about, but I'm not like you know, no. Okay. Yeah. So. Not no, so that's not on. I don't know. I'll come up with something interesting to do. Maybe I'll retrain as something else. I don't know. <laughs> well, what would be the other profession? <laughs> I don't know. I quite like interior design. Actually, interior design and the, photography. It's, it's not it's a quite good job here. It's much better than my place in Brooklyn. <laughs> thank that. you, Tracy. Thank you so much for doing the show. Uh, you've no been problem. fantastical. Um, where can people go and find you? Um, TracyCox.com is my website. And that's Tracy T R A C E Y. E-Y yeah. Cox, C O X, tracycox.com, mm-hmm. actually. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, a good yeah, point. We should probably, yeah, yeah. especially Trace- on this type of show, yeah. we got to probably. Sorry, I don't know why I said that. So it's Tracy, T R A C E Y C O X. Anyone ever say that that's like a great porn name, <laughs> Tracy Cox? I know, I know. I, that's the first question I usually get asked is, is, is it your real name? It's like, well, I think I would have come up with something a lot more inventive. Mm-hmm. And my Twitter um, tag is at Tracy Cox with a capital T and a capital C. And that's about it, really. All the information's on there. Go go buy her books. Go okay, um, buy my sex toy ranges, which are on toy, sale yes. in America, um, Australia, all online, and obviously the UK, Germany. And you can buy all those on Love Honey. Um, if you just type in Love Honey, as it sounds, okay. Um, you, or you can go into my website, and I don't know if it links. She's got. To a, it, yeah. She's got a quite. Yeah, on your site, I was seeing you have a quite the range of sex toys. So yes. you can go check those and out. And there's a range for men called Edge, which is all, which is the first ever range which is designed. To, for pleasure and performance. So, and it's really, really good. Yeah, so you guys have a ratings, sleeve. Yeah. You have a cock sleeve. Right? I've got a sleeve. I've got um, lots of penis rings. Some, so it's and the penis pump. I tell you, that's something that mm. men need to get into. It really does work to have healthy erections. It's very, especially if you're not having sex much at the moment or not masturbating. It really does help to keep your penis nice and healthy. Hmm. <laughs> All right. Well, everyone, uh, TracyCox.com. Check out her books. There's a bunch. If you have Kindles. Uh, you know we're not harming her by by doing it on kindle either (laughs) so um thank you so much uh so say goodbye to everybody okay thank you bye everybody (laughs) oh my god i got to teach tracy cox about orgies how exciting who would have thought i'd have something to, to teach a sex expert I like that part where she goes like i think it's the quiet ones who are the kinkiest you know i i think that might be a little true uh, very much enjoyed having Tracy on the show. Oh, I want to clarify. So the UK porn law ban, I fact checked because you all should fact check things you you think are questionable. So some of the sex acts that are now banned in British porn that's shot in the UK, uh, this was something that was uh, this was a law that was enacted in 2014. Uh, there is against the law to shoot scenes with fisting, choking, BDSM, squirting. Face sitting. You can't show face sitting. As and it's 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 categorized as one of the sex acts that's hazardous to your health. Yeah, because I'm just gonna totally choke on some pussy. Oh yeah, I'm just gonna get suffocated by her twat. Thank you, government, for saving us. Ugh. So I, I just thought I would update you on that. Um, say hello to Tracy and myself on Twitter. We're both big tweeters. We both enjoy it very much. She's at Tracy Cox, T-R-A-S-E-Y-C-O-X. I'm at the Billy Presida. Use the hashtag Man Whore Podcast. Let us know what you thought about the show. Uh, join the conversation with your fellow fan whores on the Man Whore Podcast subreddit. There are individual comment threads for every episode. Uh, and I also like to post pictures there. I ask you all questions. You can make posts yourself. Uh, it's a very good time. Again, uh, for all you Reddit people, that's r slash podcast. And uh, if you have any comments, questions, titty pictures that you want to share with me, uh, shoot me an email at manwhorepod at gmail.com. But until next week, uh, where we will hear from my high school prom date. Yeah. Until then, everybody, stay slutty. Stay <laughs> slutty.